this morning? Who has already got some victory this morning? Lord, we're relying on you. We're relying on you, Lord. Well, I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me And I heard about his groaning Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. to just be together in the presence of the Lord this morning. You guys can go ahead and take your seats. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are so glad that you decided to take time out of your weekend to come and be a part of the service this morning. And man, we are just believing that God is gonna do some awesome things. And so, if it happens to be your first time this morning, hey, welcome to Trinity. We are so glad to see you. In the back of the pew in front of you, you will find a Get Connected card. If you grab this card, it just shows you all the ways that you can get plugged in here at our church. And so if you would, fill that out, um, and you can drop that off two ways. When the um, offering plates come around, you can drop it in there. Or what we would love for you to do is when you walk out into our main lobby at the top of the stairs, you will see our discipleship desk. Our coordinator is there. She would love to just connect with you and find the perfect place to get you plugged in here at our church. And so we also have a gift if it's your first time or if you're a regular attender here, and this is known as Right Now Media. This is a resource that has videos, it has Bible studies, it has devotionals, it has so many great things. And so we would love if you haven't taken a look at that for you to check it out. Um, and so if you would like to do that, you can just go to your messages and you can text the number 49775 and in the message box, put the word tag and you will be sent a subscription link to that. Again, there's so many great things. We would love for everybody in the church to just take a look and check it out. It's a great resource. And so we have also created a QR code here at our church. It's on the screen behind me or in the bulletin that you received this morning. You can scan that, you can check in um, and just let us know that you were here and apart. And so again, any of these announcements, they're on the back of the bulletin. So if you miss something, feel free to turn it over, check it out there. Um, and for whatever reason, if you cannot do the QR code on the end of your pews, you will find blue books. If you would grab those, sign in, just so we can know that you are here and apart this morning. Man, we are believing that God is going to continue to do big things here at our church. And so if you would, check out these video announcements. If you want to make memories and bless those in our community, please sign up for Journey to Bethlehem. We are accepting sign-ups until August 28th. More specifically, we need people to sign up to help build the sets. Our life groups are starting soon. If you would like to sign up, see Holly at the Welcome Center. Mark your calendars for Man Up and Invited on Wednesday, August 30th. If you're joining us online, we're so glad you decided to spend part of your weekend with us. For ways to engage with us here at Trinity, see the description below the video. Now if you're able, please stand for worship. 
All right. One of the things, uh, many things I love about our church, but two things I really like near the top, that we are spirit-led, we strive to be spirit-led and Bible-based. You take those two away, I'm not coming to this church. I'll tell you that right now. And who loves the Word of God in here this morning? You love His Word? Psalms 100, verse 4 says, tells us when we come to church and when you get in a car, when you raise your kids, when you go to work, it tells us how we are to approach the Lord. Psalms 100, verse 4 says, we are to enter His gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We are to enter His courts with praise. And this morning, when I was getting ready, I felt the Lord put on my heart, like when you come to my house, if there's a gate or a fence outside the yard, you might walk by and go, hey, Sam, how you doing? But if I invite you in my front door and I shut the door, we sit down at the kitchen table with my family, we're having fellowship, we're having love. And God wants that from us. He wants us not just to be on the gates. He wants us to key into the holy of holies and commune with him heart to heart. And so how do we do that? We first start with entering his gates with thanksgiving. So whoever wants to join me right now, lift your hands, close your eyes, and I want, I'll lead you. You start thanking the Lord. What can you thank him for? Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for having a roof over my head. Thank you for my wonderful wife and my children. Thank you, Lord, for my needs, my the food on my table. Thank you that I'm whole, I'm healthy. All right, we thank him for what he does for us. But here's the part I love the most. We enter his courts with praise. You praise him not for what he's done for you. You praise him for who he is. Let's praise him. Lord, I praise you for you are always good. You are merciful. You are gracious to me when I don't deserve it. You're forgiving to me when I don't deserve it. You're powerful when I need to. You're all wise. You're all holy. You're perfect. There's nothing too hard for you. We praise you this morning for who you are. Now we're going to sing this song and let it out. Don't hold it in, what you just did. Let it out. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, this morning. You're amazing. Woo! I've got a praise that will break off heavy chains. I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their graves. I gotta let it out. I gotta let it out. I gotta let it out. All right, I think you mean that this morning. Thank you, Lord. Why would I ever stay silent when you are the one who told me to speak? And how could I ever be quiet when you've given me this authority? I'm not ashamed. I won't be afraid. I gotta let it out, cause I gotta praise that will break off heavy change. I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their graves. Woo! I gotta let it out. I gotta let it out. I gotta let it out. Woo! Why would I need man's permission? You're calling me to live wild and free. Why would I need man's religion? You don't need it. Your spirit's living inside of me. I'm not ashamed. I won't be afraid. I gotta let it out. Cause I gotta praise that will break off heavy chain. I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their grave. sing till I have no voice. Even then I'm gonna make I don't care. I don't care what people say. I'm gonna praise you anyway. Woo! I don't wanna sing till I have no voice. Even then I'm gonna make some noise. I don't care what people say. I'm gonna I'm gonna sing till I have no voice Even then I'm gonna make some noise I don't care what people say I'm gonna praise 
just lift your voices, lift your voices and sing. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. Holy, holy, holy. 
Thank you, Jesus, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Can you just say that with me? Thank you, Jesus, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Can you just breathe in and say, thank you, Jesus that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Jesus, you care about us. You see us, you love us. You see our burdens, you see what we carry. 
and we can bring them to you. So we bring them to you now. If the prayer partners can come forward, they wanna pray with you. If you have a burden, if you have a need in your life, they wanna be there to walk beside you, to stand beside you and just pray over you and declare the goodness of God over your life. We're getting ready to do a new song and it is just so beautiful. Mike and I heard it and we just played it over and over and over in our house. And it was like our, our home began to be filled with peace. And so my prayer for you, even though you don't know this new song, that you would just fall into his peace and fall into his rest today because that's, that's who he is. It's a busy time. School's getting ready to start. <laughs> Parents are thinking, I'm not ready, or maybe you are ready. <laughs> but it's a crazy time. But when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, when we keep our hearts fixed on Him and we just fall into His rest and His peace, there's no other place that you would rather be, right? His presence, that's all we need. That's all we need. Jesus is all we need. You are all we need, Jesus.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you love us, Jesus. May your love be felt and known by people here today. I know that's, that's what you want. You want people to feel your presence and know your power and your love in their lives. Thankful for prayer today. We met with several of our key people that served yesterday, and I said to them, I'm, I'm so thankful that you can pray. I mean, sometimes I think we take it for granted, but what a void in, in my life there would be if I couldn't pray with people. I don't know that we fully comprehend the, the gift that that is, that we can talk to God about what's going on in our life and that He listens to us and that for whatever reason, His love for us, He, he gets more involved, deeper involved. He, he's moved when we talk to Him. And so don't miss your moment. I, I know you can pray without me. I know you can pray without being in church. But sometimes we come here and it's just a reminder. We can do these things. We, uh, you can talk to Jesus. You can talk to the everlasting God. And he cares about you. And he knows your name. And he, he knows your situation. And I can't understand or predict the timing of why and when and how and all that kind of stuff. But I know that Jesus can do anything, anywhere, anytime, and anyone. And so I invite you to lean in him today. I was just thinking as I was standing down there like, and this is a great crowd today, but can you imagine like if Jesus physically walked into the room today, how the atmosphere would change? I mean, what do you think he would do, really? Like, right? I'm, I don't know if everybody would just like instantly like <laughs> go down. I, I think that, I don't know if people would run to him. People would, there would be emotion. I prayed with a young lady that's, in her probably 20s, McKenna today, that's already had multiple surgeries in her body. The, the hope level would rise. People would run. They'd just like, I got to get there. I got to get to Jesus. And Jesus is here with us today. His Spirit is in the room. He lives inside of us. He sent the Holy Spirit to, to, to connect us to Him today. And I, I would love for Jesus to physically walk in the room today, but the power of his presence is still here today, and I, I challenge you to close your eyes and think of what it would be like if Jesus was standing in front of you right now. If, if he was right there, because he is, he lives in you. If you know him, he's a believer, he's, he lives in you. But imagine, close your eyes tightly and just imagine him right there and what would you like to say if you had five seconds ten seconds in the physical presence of Jesus what would you want to say and I say say it talk to him right now I'm going to lead us in prayer but talk to him from your heart unburden yourself say whatever it is Jesus I'm scared Jesus I love you Jesus would you heal me of whatever Jesus would you work in my marriage what is it that you would say to Jesus if he was right there because he is thank you Jesus your promise is that your presence would never leave us or forsake us, that you would be with us always. And so by faith, we believe and know that you are here in this room with us today, that somehow miraculously your spirit takes up residence in our hearts. And some days we feel like such unworthy hosts and vessels. And Paul writes, we have this treasure in these jars of clay. He was talking about how normal we are and that the king of glory would choose to live inside our space our hearts and humbly we we just lift our hands and our hearts towards you today and say Jesus I, I, I want you to expand inside of me <laughs> fill this jar <laughs> fill this space Holy Spirit Because life is, is dry and it's empty and it's painful and it's discouraging at times and confusing and 
Jesus, I need to know you. I need to know that you're there. I need to hear your voice talking to me. I need to feel your presence. And I want that, and I know you do for everybody that's in this room and everybody that's watching today. And I I know that sometimes it's just the initiation of our own faith where something happens and it changes the normal to something abnormal. Maybe we get up from the coffee table and we take a knee. Maybe we change our position. Maybe we walk over in the corner of the room and we raise our hands and something breaks and the Spirit of the Lord comes on us and it's different all of a sudden and we know you're there. And I pray that for people today, Lord Jesus. I pray that all over this room today that You'll crack through the ordinary. You'll crack through the pain. You'll crack through the regular. You'll crack through our routines, Lord Jesus. You'll crack through our emotions and things. And that that people will have a moment with you, Lord Jesus, that becomes another moment and another moment. And they stack those on, Lord Jesus. And they their relationship with you takes a leap, oh God. We look around us at the world that we're in right now and it's so easy to get discouraged and so we reach out for you today. I'm, I'm so thrilled with hope to see all these people in this room today and I'm challenging every one of them to say, Lord Jesus, would you live among us so that there would be a, a lighthouse in this community during these dark days? Would you live among us so, so the people that that are searching for something that's real and meaningful and that brings hope back to their lives and truth. They could find that in a place like this. Oh God, would you be pleased to live amongst us? Holy Spirit, would you be pleased to live among us? Speak to us today, oh God, throughout this morning. Heal the sick. Encourage the brokenhearted, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for a chance to worship you. We don't move quickly in and out of this space and this place. We love you, Lord. If you haven't said it yet, I give you a couple more seconds here today to say something to Jesus from your heart right now before we move on today. I love you, Jesus. I need you, God. Talk to me today, Holy Spirit. Change me in ways that you know I need it. Touch every heart and life that's in this room and watching today in some way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Great to be in God's presence today. Wonderful. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Whew. Last week, we if you missed it, we preached this message, I still love the church. And one of the first ideas that I threw out there, I still love the church because it's a place of God's presence. And I mean, you can experience God's presence as a believer anywhere out on a mountaintop, uh, you know, in your laundry room, if you, you know, if you think of it and engage or whatever. But You know, there's just something about when two or three people gather in his name and his his presence is the promise that he made to the church. If two or three of you gather in my name, I'll be there, I promise. I promise. And we need the presence of the Lord. And once you experience it, this was the point I was making. I don't think you can find it anywhere else. And it's, it's unique about the church that the presence of the Lord is there when everything's right when hearts are right and his presence comes it's uh, how many of you've been in a service or a situation before and the presence of the lord was so strong you're like you just didn't want to leave like right you just want, I wish you could like bottle it up and well, let's just stay here <laughs> you know this feels like heaven on earth and it is it's a piece of heaven on earth well welcome today i met so many wonderful uh, people today, uh, new people coming in every week, and we're just honored uh, that you would choose to visit and be our guest, and we hope that you have a great experience, and we hope that you'll come some more, and exciting times for the church as we head towards the fall, another fall. School starts on Monday. Kids are so excited. <laughs> I found my, I was talking to several kids, school start Monday, yeah, and I'm like, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> so that reminds me of that one commercial where the parents are like, it's the most wonderful time of the year. You know, <laughs> Parents are all dancing around. Woo, kids are going back to school. Little me time. Uh, we pray you have an incredible, incredible year. And uh, so, you know, speaking of that, college students are going to be back with us next Sunday. College students are coming. There, there's a few of the Chi Alpha workers here. Today, but there's a service on campus right now. Is there not today, this morning? There's a, there's a, the Chi Alpha people are uh, there's a service on campus at Fairmont State today that they're hosting. But next week is roll out the red carpet to college students Sunday. And those four or five rows over there, I, be- I hope we blow them out. I hope there's so many kids that they don't fit. And I want you to be a part of it. I want you to be prepared for it. How many of you love that college students want to come to church? All right. And so... Anybody next week that looks like a college student, I want you to make your way to them and say, I am, slap them five and say, I am so pumped that you are here today. Welcome. Can I do your laundry? Do you need some candy? What do you, I'm serious. I want them to feel like VIPs next Sunday. And here's one of the things that I want to lay out to you before the offering is received today. Uh, they have a Chick-fil-A and a Starbucks on their campus at Fairmont State. And so I'm going to challenge you today because I'd like to see every student that comes at least get a $10 gift certificate to Chick-fil-A and Starbucks that they can use on their campus. And to make it simple, I thought, well, you know what? Just put in $10, write a check or write on the offering envelope for college students, denominations of 10, and we'll save you the trip and we'll go buy the gift certificates and we'll lay them on their seats over there next Sunday. And when they come in, we'll just bless them in a number of different ways. These ushers and section over here, super friendly next week as the students come in and make them feel just so welcome. And we're doing special things at the cafe for them. And they're having a thing after service for college students with a giant charcuterie board and stuff. And uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a table with meat and cheese. Right? How many of you guys just got excited? (laughs) Table with meat and cheese, and I'm there, man. It's going to be great. And so... Uh, Thank you for your faithful giving to the Lord. Our ushers are coming today. You can give three ways uh, in the offering. You can give online at tagchurch.org. Pull down the Give tab and just follow the instructions there to give one time or uh, in in any kind of some of the denominations that are there. You can send your offerings to the church through the mail at 70 Maranatha Drive. Or if you're here today, you got it real easy. You just take out your $1,000 and you drop it right in the offering when it comes by. Today, Thank you for your faithful giving to the work of the Lord. We just had board meeting this last week, celebrated again. And we're churches running with several thousand dollars ahead of last year. And it was a banner year the, that year. And so we just are grateful, you know, just grateful to the Lord. Uh, and I believe it's because of your generosity and uh, the good stewardship of the board and our determination that we're not going to sit on that money. We're going to use it to further the kingdom of God, uh, both here and around the world. And so we're going to pray over the tithes and offering, and I believe there's a Celebrate Recovery uh, promo that is going to play uh, after I say the amen. Thank you, Jesus, that I have clothes on my back and and a house, a roof over my head, and a truck to drive, Lord Jesus, and uh, I'm spoiled, honestly. I'm just, you're so good to us as Americans. We don't even understand it. Uh, but thank you, Lord Jesus, for every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father above. And, and we praise you. And, and one of the ways that we show our gratefulness and that we get unhinged from the love of money is to be generous back towards the God who gives us everything. And so, God, we, we say we love you today by honoring you with this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Where did your dreams go? The dreams of childhood? 
wishes the young and innocent heart, the hopes to make the team or to make the winning play, to make your family proud, the dreams to go somewhere, to do something, to become something, to get out ahead of the world, to leave behind your fears and worries, to see how vast and beautiful the world can be, to discover, to dare, to dive in, to know and be known, to love and be loved. All of those dreams, where did they go? One day we wake up and we feel the weight of our decisions, the consequences of what we've done and what's been done to us, the words, the actions, the lies, the addictions, the shame, the cycles, anger, the spiral. There's an emptiness that sets in. And all the years, the days and the dreams that are gone, we wake up and realize we're not as strong as we think we are. And it may have taken a great sorrow for us to realize that. But thankfully, you're not the only one with a dream for your life. There is one, our maker, our creator, the dream giver, who before you were even born had a plan for your life, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. The one who imagined you, who delights in you, who gave up his own life for you. He has a plan for you. It's bigger than your mistakes, bigger than your regrets, bigger than all the hurts, hangups, and habits that have tried to steal your hope. No matter where you've been and no matter what you've done, you're not too far gone. God is for you and his dreams for your future are good. A future of joy, a future of purpose, a future filled with redemption and renewal, promise and possibility. Don't stop now. Don't give up yet. This is the part where the story gets good, where the battles are won, where the prodigals come home, where the dead awaken to life. Your past is not your future. There is a God who does the impossible. There is more to come. Come, rejoice with us. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery. I don't even need to preach now. I mean, isn't that good? I mean, you know it's good. I mean, you look at the response that just, I didn't, you didn't even know it was coming. I didn't even know it was that good, that it was coming. And uh, when everybody is caught up in something, just by listening to it and watching it, then you know it's impactful. In fact, that's so impactful. I don't know if Michelle's here or watching online today. I want us to post that on our Facebook site. So you can watch it again this week. Some of you could probably use watching that again like Tuesday or Thursday or sometime this week. That was inspiring stuff. Jesus picks people up, places them on their feet again, gives them a hope and a future. Every Tuesday night right back here in our youth room, we have 20 plus people that are gathering Sometimes as many as 30 plus gathering to overcome hurts, habits, and hangups. It can be anything from uh, abuse that happened when you were young, physical, sexual, emotional. It can be uh, some kind of a hurt or hang up, an anger problem. Uh, it's not just drugs and alcohol. It's certainly for people that are trying to overcome some sort of a, an addiction. It's support. It's Christ-centered support for people that want to get well and redeem their lives in Jesus' name and move forward from the things that hang you up. And Jesus wants a hope and a future for you. And I love that. I love that. And I'm inspired by it. And be inspired by it yourself. Don't stay the same. Why would you stay the same? You're alive, you're breathing, you got an opportunity to make things better with Jesus' help. Step into it, reclaim your life, reclaim your future, celebrate recovery on Tuesday nights. Appreciate Dean and Gar and and, uh, Kim and all those that lead back there doing a great job. Praise the Lord. This is the third message in our series, Prescription for a Healthy Church. I've loved it already. Uh, A healthy church is not a building. A healthy church is not bricks and mortar and steel and re-rod. A healthy 
Church is a group of people following Jesus. They can meet out under the open stars. They can meet in a tent. They can meet in somebody's living room. They can meet in a giant cathedral. They can meet in a mega church. They can meet here at Trinity Assembly. They can meet out in the parking lot. It's whether two or three are gathered in his name. The church is without walls. Jesus shows up. He's there. He started it. He breathed it to life. It's got flaws because we're in it. But Jesus makes up the difference when the church is functioning like it ought to, when Jesus is in the center of it, when the Holy Spirit is working in it. There's nothing like the church on the face of the earth with the capability of bringing something of heaven down into earth. And we need that like never before right now. If a church is going to be healthy, that church must build its teachings and philosophies and leadership principles and attitudes and ideologies on Jesus And the Bible gives us the recipe or the Rx, the prescription for a healthy church. And we've looked at a couple of them already. We started out with follow the leader, the cure for spiritual guidance. Jesus, following Jesus is the cure for misdirection. There's a lot of confused, misdirected people in this world today. Depression is rampant. Uh, Counselors are maxed out. There's a lot of hurting, confused People, there's a lot of aimlessness, and Jesus, if we follow the leader, Jesus can get people home. He can get them back on track. Last week we preached that message. I still love the church. It's got its flaws and things, and yet there's not the church offers certain things that there is no replica for, nothing else like in all the world. And we want to be a church like that next week. The cure for unity uh, and is in, or the cure for division, rather, which is unity. Today, we want to talk about the cure for selfishness, which is sacrifice. The prescription for selfishness is sacrifice. To understand why we need the prescription for sacrifice, we first have to analyze some things. And you have a bulletin that you received on your way in. It's got some outline places to take notes. Also on U version, uh, there's an outline if you look up, if you use the U version app for Bible uh, and look up events and Trinity, and you can find an electronic version of this as well. We're doing this because we want to be a great church, right? I, I know I caught you by surprise. There, so let me give you another shot at that one. We're doing this kind of a series and talking about these subjects because we want to be a great church for Jesus, right? We want to honor him. We want this to be a place where people, it's the real deal, you know. I, I know, I know. You've heard it. I've heard it. You've said it. Uh, you know, you've heard people complain about the church and all that kind of thing. Let's be the solution, not the problem. Let's be the answer. Let's look around for ways to make it better. Let's honor Jesus. And if there's ever a time when that was needed, it's now. And so today we're talking about selfishness because, believe it or not, in many good churches, selfishness gets in and messes things up. Right? And you'll see that in the message today. You'll perhaps see yourself in it or somebody that you've known, or whatever. But, I mean, we all have this illness, and it's sin in general, but part of sin is selfishness. As human beings, we've all inherited this unhealthy condition. The Bible diagnoses it as sin, right? And it says we all have this illness. For Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We... Sin, when it spilled into our world, it it separated us from relationship with God. And it poured all kinds of junk into our world and into our personal lives that that impact us and hurt us and harm us and damage us. And, And one of these is selfishness. And you look at it on the surface and you may think, well, it's not that big a deal. There's a lot of other worse things in the world, but selfishness can lead to a lot of addictive and, and damaging behaviors and relationship disruption. And we all, uh, here's, here's one of the ways that I know sin is inherited. If you're a parent, then you have seen your little kids argue over toys, right? I mean, if you're, if you, you've heard these kind of conversations if you've got little kids. That's my truck. That's my dolly. That's my ball. Parents do not have to teach their kids to be selfish, right? 
A good parent has to do just the opposite. What do we have to do? Now, honey, share that toy with your brother. You know, and you look over in a little bit, and they're hitting they, the, their brother on the head with it. <laughs> or vice versa. You know, that's how it goes and in real life. And so you've got to teach them to share. You've got to teach them not to be selfish. You've got to teach them to be generous because we all have the mind. Mine, 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 mine. That's mine. Let me have that. Get your hands off of that. That's mine. Even as children, we learn it's hard to share. Why? Because we are fighting the inherited illness of sin that makes us selfish. Nobody taught that. It's inherent in us. We have to unteach it. It's already in early stages the work of sin taking place in an innocent little child's life, right? And to guard them, we've got to as good parents, we got to explain what's going on there. And that's not healthy. That's not good. And the conversations, you know, we don't grow out of it. We just uh, become bigger kids with bigger toys. Right? That's my boat. That's my quad. You know? That's my stuff. That's my house. That's my land. That's my whatever, you know? And, and, and it just the toys get bigger. And the conversations either out loud or in our heads. Oh, I want... Boy. I need, I deserve, I've got to have, I've got it coming to me. And believe it or not, that can creep into a church, right? The eyes have it. Because of sin, it's more natural for us to take than to give. That's part of why we do an offering every week, you know, and you, you can complain about it stuff, but, you know, the Bible talks over, and Jesus talked about money about as much as any other subject that he talked about before because selfishness would have you hoard that, and it will get a hold of your heart. And so that's why he said it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. When wealth gets you, when selfishness gets you, you're in trouble. It gets its hooks in you. It's easier to be stingy than it is to share. It's easier to want to be served than to serve. It's easier to hold on than to surrender all. It's easier to be selfish than to sacrifice. And the disease of selfishness even creeps into the church. And here's how it does. That's my seat. I see some people and they come a little late and somebody new comes and gets their seat and they walk in and they don't even know what to do. And they call for an usher. Can you help me? I, I, don't, know where to, I don't know where to sit. I don't know what to do. My, my equilibrium's off. Somebody took my seat. I've been sitting there for 50 years. I think it's a, I love people that move. I, I mean, sometimes, because I, I can look out at people, and, and I can pretty well in my head, I can go, okay, I know they sit there, and they sit there, and they sit there. I love people that I can't find them. And, and I'm like, you know, and they're, 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 they're over here, they're over there. They're over here. I, in some ways, I think it's healthy because you, you meet new people, right? You, you, or at least you got a shot. You meet new people, you know, and stuff. And I'm not being down on it if you're sitting in the same seat. Love you all no matter what, okay? Uh, but uh, I, and I think it's healthy when, I think it's healthy in general when we just don't get too set in our ways. Be okay with change, you know, the older we get, they talk about, and we did that one series, it talks about you start working out of the, the imagination part of your brain, you stop functioning out of it anymore, and you start living in memories, and you get set in your ways. And so I think it's important to bust that every chance you get, the older you get. Change things up. Try something different. That's my parking spot. That's not the way my mama taught me to dress when you come to church. Well, so Sorry. You know what? Jesus doesn't care what's on the outside. And I got biblical proof. He said to the Pharisees, you guys are, you look all fancy, but you're dressed up dead men's bones. God doesn't care what's on the outside. He cares what's on the inside more about than how, how many of you have met real fancy dressed hypocrites? A suit and tie does not make you godly. Right? And I, here's, here's my theory, wear, uh, it, wear what, 
what you like to wear when you come to church for the most part. All right, be decent and that kind of say. We prefer you wear clothes when you come to church. We really do. Um, but I don't get hung up on that kind of stuff because I don't think Jesus gets hung up on that. I think Jesus gets more hung up on when we pick on each other for what we're wearing. Because that's selfish. That's dividing. That kind of a thing, you know. James says this, if you're wise and you understand God's ways, live a life of steady goodness so that only good deeds pour forth. And if you don't brag about the good you do, then you'll truly be wise. And here's where it picks up in your outline or on the screen. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about being wise. That's the worst kind of lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and motivated by the devil. Sometimes the Bible says stuff that surprises you, right? You're thinking selfishness. That's not that big a deal. Paul, Paul says it's a big deal. He said it comes from the devil. For whether, wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and every kind of evil. Church splits start over selfishness. I want things my way. No? James says selfishness isn't a minor little thing you ignore. It's a disease. It's, unearth, or it's earthly. It's unspiritual. It's motivated by the devil. And if you don't get the prescription to the cure for it, then your church and your life and your home and your family and your marriage will be full of disorder and every kind of evil. Guarantee you, if you're selfish, you don't have a great marriage. If it's all about you, what makes you happy, you want to... Flip your marriage, start doing everything you can to make your spouse happy. I'm not doing that if he doesn't do it. Well, somebody's got to start. How about the most mature one start? If you don't get it right, then it'll mess your life up in your home, in your church. And what can be done about this disease? And if you read the Bible, only God could provide the prescription or the cure for this illness of sin and sickness and disease. And the cure was nothing else but his self, himself, Christ, right? There's many famous names related to the medical field who discovered cures for terrible diseases. Uh, I'll test some of you today. Uh, Jonas Salk, anybody know what he did? Polio vaccine. Bing, bing, bing. All right, it's a game. Uh, some of you just won. How many of you are game show people? Three. It's great. <laughs> Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin to the nurse over. No, I'm just kidding. Just. She's shaking her heads, but maybe, maybe. It's great. A uh, cure for numerous bacterial infections, penicillin. Edward Jenner. Love it when you learn in church. He developed the smallpox vaccine. Edward Jenner. The cures and medical breakthroughs that men uh, and, and others like them discovered have saved millions of lives. Wouldn't it be crazy to have come up with a cure that, like, saved millions of lives? I, I, I thought of that. I developed that. I had a little dish one day, and I was mixing stuff, you know. And I, I created something that saved millions of lives. Many of them worked years. Some of them devoted their entire lives to find the medical breakthrough and produce the cure. One of the most interesting stories of a medical breakthrough that I've ever heard is the one I'm about to tell you. The date was February the 15th, 1921. New York City, in the operating room of the Kane Summit Hospital, Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane is performing an appendectomy. In his distinguished 37-year medical career, he has performed nearly 4,000 appendectomies. So this surgery would be uneventful except for two things. The first, the use of local anesthesia. In a major surgery, Dr. Kane is a crusader against the hazards of general anesthesia. Many of his colleagues agree with him in principle, but in order for them to agree in practice, they have to see it work. They have to see it, that theory applied. Dr. Kane searched then for a patient willing to undergo surgery while under local anesthesia, but a volunteer was not easy to find. How many of you are in the medical field? Raise your hands out there. Awesome. 
Awesome. Thank you for what you do to care for people and help us get well and stay well. Many of the potential candidates for this surgery were squeamish at the thought of being awake during their surgery, right? I don't want to see you take my appendix out right in front of my face. Right? I can understand others were fearful that the anesthesia might wear off too soon. Right? And eventually, however, Dr. Kane found a candidate. On February the 15th, the patient was prepped, wheeled into the operating room. The local anesthetic was applied. And as he had done thousands of times, Dr. Kane dissects the superficial tissues, locates the appendix, skillfully excises it, and concludes the surgery. During the procedure, the patient complains only of minor discomfort. The volunteer is taken into post-op, then placed in a hospital ward. Dr. Kane had proven his theory. Thanks to the willingness of a brave volunteer, Kane demonstrated that local anesthesia was a viable, even preferable alternative. But I said there were two facts about this surgery that made it unique. I told you the first, the use of local anesthesia. The second is the patient. The courageous candidate for surgery by Dr. Kane was Dr. Kane. <laughs> to prove his point, Dr. Kane operated on himself using mirrors to see the work area. The doctor became a patient in order to bring healing. Get it? Spiritually, you get it? God became one of us to heal us all. God stepped into our skin. He came down and he took our disease upon himself. Surely he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, sinless, spotless. God took all of my junk, all of my sin, so that I could be free, so that I could be cured. Of sin, selfishness is part of it. Unable to find a worthy candidate capable of curing us, God himself broke the curse of sin and selfishness with the most selfless act imaginable. He himself became the cure. I love this verse. If you don't know it, you should memorize it. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's talking about Jesus. God made the sinless son of God, Jesus. He put all of our sin on him. I don't understand it. It's, it's hard to fathom and understand. He carried the weight. Uh, I don't like carrying the weight of my own sin some days, right? Jesus carried all of our sins on himself. And he won. He was victorious. He bore that burden. He took the nails. He, he, he was in agony for it. God put it all on him so that through a prayer that any of us could pray, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. A, a, a miracle surgery takes place. And God looks down, and he doesn't just see you anymore. Put your name in there, Jeff, Tom, and Sally. Well, he sees Jesus all over you. He sees the sinlessness of his son on you. Greater love is no man than this that one lay down his life for his friends. And we're naturally selfish. We want, we take, we hoard it all for ourselves. We're self-protective. We're self-absorbed. Paul articulated the struggle in Romans 7, 21 to 25. I'm reading it from a, a different translation, but I, I call this the do-do passage. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I should do, I do. It shouldn't do, I do. You know, but here's how it says it in the NLT. It seems to be a fact of life that what I want to do, what is right, and I inevitably do what is wrong. Anybody relate to that? I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another law at work within me that's at war with my, at war with my mind. And this law wins the fight and often makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. This is Paul the Apostle. And listen what he says. Oh, what a miserable person I am when I am in this place, in this dilemma where this tug of war is going on. I mean, some days, come on, just be honest. Some days, aren't there days when you just feel like, oh, man, anything from I'm a loser to, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, a sinful man. I'm flawed. I'm so flawed, you know. 
That's what Paul's saying. I have great days. I started churches. I planted churches all over the Mediterranean rim. I love Jesus. I had a personal encounter with him. He changed me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. But he's still being honest, and he's saying, there's days. There's days when I feel yucky, flawed, sinful. And here's how he says it. Oh, what a miserable person I am on those days. How many of you have days when you're a miserable person? Ask somebody beside you. They'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Just yesterday. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin? And he asks a question that he already knows the answer for. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God there's an answer for my miserableness. Thank God there's an answer for my selfishness. Thank God there's an answer for your sinfulness. Thank God there's an answer for your hopelessness. It is Jesus Christ, the cure for what ails us. He became the cure, but you got to follow the prescription. And here it is, and Paul goes on to talk about it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can get a, a full dose of Jesus. You can get a complete injection of the supernatural inside of your life. Oh, Jesus, inject me with your life and your power and your healing and your wholeness and your purity, your holiness today, I pray, Lord Jesus. A prescription does you no good if you don't take the medicine, right? I mean, you could, you could have a prescription for what ails you given to you by a professional. You could be dying from some disease and walking by the bottle containing the medicine with the cure every day, right? And you're still dying, and the cure's sitting on the counter. It's in the cab, it's in the medicine cabinet. All you have to do is pop the top off, take it as directed by your doctor, and you could be cured. Imagine that. We cannot, we, here's the deal. We cannot cure ourselves of sin. Now, there's people in the world that would argue with that. There's people in the world that don't even think there is such a thing as sin. But I look all around me, and I see evidence every day that there's sin. People don't just go in schools and start shooting kids if there's not sin, right? People don't rape people. People don't abuse people. People don't abuse their own children. People don't start, for the sake of money, taking kids and selling them for sex. Right? How do you explain that? That's poor upbringing? No. There's more than that. There's people that had great upbringings that fall into sin and do diabolical things. All for the love of money. You know what drives the sex slave industry? It's money. Sell little children for money. We have a disease. We cannot cure ourselves. According to the Bible, God has the only formula, and he knew it. He would send his own perfect, sinless son to bleed and to die for our sin and our selfishness. If you want to be free from sin, the Bible says the prescription is to get a heavy dose of Jesus in you. In you. Galatians 2.20 then. Paul says this. He says, I've, had, I've been inoculated. I still struggle. I'm still miserable some days. But thank God I know this. I no longer live, but Christ lives inside of me. It's no longer I that lives, but I got help from heaven living inside of me. Colossians 1.27, God decided to let his people know his rich and glorious secret, which he has for all people. This secret is Christ himself who is in you. He is our only hope for glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a mystery, right? A perfect, sinless God willing to live inside imperfect, sin-filled people, becoming the cure for what ails us, and I am sinless because God was selfless. God loved me that much, and he loved you that much, that he would take on all that pain so that you 
could be sin free. And I'm so grateful to be forgiven. I'm so grateful. That, that, come on, those of you that understand this today, uh, how many of you are just grateful to be forgiven today? It's nothing that we did. It's nothing that we did. Why don't you just stop there a second. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Think of what you could have been. Think of what you used to be and say, thank you, Jesus, right now, huh? Mm. And if you're sitting there today saying, I'm still in trouble. I'm, I'm still a, a, a dumpster fire. I'm a mess. Oh, man, you're in a good place today. Because Jesus has the cure for what ails you. We stop right now. I got a little bit more to say, but we're just going to stop right now. And if you need Jesus in your life, and this is what we do every, every Sunday, every week, we hold out this hope that is Jesus Christ, that the sinless Son of God came into the world to take away our sins. We've all inherited it. It's not like you're worse than us. We're all in the same boat. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who can live up to God's standard? No, none of us. We're flawed. Sin broke that ability. But I hold out hope to you. And it has nothing to do with Trinity Assembly. It has nothing to do with the denomination. It has nothing to do with organized church. It has to do everything with a God who loved you so much he sent heaven's best to come into this world so that God could inoculate you from the sin that's in your life. He could cure you from what ails you. He could take away sin in every form that it is. He could heal you. He could make you ready for heaven and I want that for you, and God wants that for you right now. So I pause in the presence of the Lord, and everybody that was here a while ago thanking Jesus that you've been forgiven is praying for you right now because we love you, and we want you to be free. We want you to, be, to know Jesus personally. We want, we want it so bad for you. People are praying for you. Come on, pray right now for anybody in the room that might not know Jesus right now. It means everything. This is why this church exists. This church doesn't exist to... I don't know, you name whatever it is, we exist for one reason only, to introduce people to Jesus because he's got the cure for what ails the world. He's the sin remover. He's the hope giver. This moment can change everything for you. So we're leaning in. God's leaning out in heaven He's loved you from the day you were being put together in your mother's womb. He's whispering in your spirit, in your ear right now, come to me, come on home right now. It's not a game. It's not a joke. It's not emotion. There's a God that made you and loves you and wants you for himself. You're all he ever thinks about. He can heal you in your mind, in your body, in your spirit. He can make you invincible. He can make you eternal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we're going to say a prayer in just a moment, a simple prayer that you can repeat or say something like it in your own words today to give you the opportunity to invite the sinless son of God to cover over your sins, to inoculate you, Against the consequences of sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm, I want that for you so bad today. God wants that for you so bad. He came and bled for you. That's how bad he wants you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you'd like to invite Jesus into your heart, if you get it today, you're saying, yes, I get it. I've inherited the disease of sin, and Jesus is the only cure. I want to say that prayer. I want God to come and live inside of me and to move sin out. I want to do that today. Then pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that God sent you from heaven, perfect, sinless. You came into this broken world for the sake of people like me. I recognize in me the work of sin. I've done things. I think about things that aren't good, that have hurt me, that have hurt others, that have hurt you. Right now in this moment, Jesus understanding that you love me 
in spite of all that and that you're the only cure for sin, I ask you to forgive me. And I invite you to move inside of me, inoculate me, heal me, drive sin out of my life, give me a fresh start. I welcome you. I want you. I need you. Be my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. A very private, very special, very eternal moment. If you prayed that prayer, it's amazing to me that a one-minute prayer can change where you spend your forever. If you prayed that prayer, we want to congratulate you. And heaven is rejoicing over that decision that you made right now. And we love to celebrate. We want to rejoice over it with you today. So if you prayed that prayer and asked God to come into your life and forgive you of your sins, nobody looking around. I'm looking right at you today. Jesus and me looking at you. Raise your hand if you prayed that prayer today. Anybody? God bless you. God bless you. A couple in the back. Anybody else? We live for these moments. I prayed that prayer. I asked God to come into my life. Awesome moments. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We live for moments like this. If you prayed that prayer, I saw at least three hands. There may have been others that were raised as well. And we congratulate you today on the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. I'd love to meet you personally. I'd love to meet you personally. I don't, I don't want you to be alone because Jesus doesn't want you to be alone. We got at least 21 life groups that are going to launch this fall in September. 21 options and opportunities for you to get connected to somebody that can know your name and have your back and be praying for you. And you need that and we want that for you. Let me finish this message up today because I want Trinity to be known as a place that's about sacrifice. How many of you would agree with me to that today, all right? Sacrifice, not selfishness. And those people are all about themselves. They think they're so good, whatever. No. Those people would give you the shirt off their back over there at Trinity. Those people show up down at the homeless shelters and they bring pepperoni rolls and clothes. And we do. Almost every week there's somebody ministering down at one of the homeless shelters. Those, those people give teachers. I mean, a couple, a couple years ago during COVID, we sent a gift to every teacher. It started out with one school and we're like, well, we can't stop there. We can send a, a gift to every teacher. Uh, that, that place loves to sacrifice. People willing to make great sacrifices are motivated by beliefs and ideals that run deep. The 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence mutually pledged their their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And if you study the history of it, many of them were captured or killed during the Revolutionary War. Their homes were born, burned. Their families were taken captive. Some died in poverty. One of them, a famous story at the Battle of Yorktown, uh, British General Cornwallis had taken Thomas Nelson's home as his headquarters. And Thomas Nelson stood there looking at his home, knowing that the enemy was there, and quietly gave the permission to General George Washington to open fire on his own home. He died penniless, bankrupt. Such noble acts of sacrifice birth a great nation. I say, God, bring us back to a place where we're more about sacrifice as a nation than selfishness. We'd be a lot better off. Everybody's into themselves. Sacrifice is a powerful change agent. Our U.S. Armed Force veterans love freedom to the point of sacrifice. Greater love has no man than this that one would lay down his life for his friends. But honestly, there are people that laid down their lives for strangers because they believed in the ideal of freedom. We sit here today because the apostles became the first in a long line of martyrs who gave their lives for the cause of Christ. Did you know this? Every day, 13 Christians Worldwide are killed because of their faith. More than 300 a month, people that call Christ as their Lord and Savior, more than 300 a month are martyred for their belief. And, and we are having the trouble deciding whether we're going to get up and go to church. <laughs> Sacrifice will change a church. Here's people that are like, I'll, I'll lay down my life for Jesus. And we're like, yeah, I don't know. There's a festival today. Maybe I'll go. Maybe I won't. 
12 churches or church buildings are attacked every day. 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, while another five are abducted. As the writer of Hebrews puts it, the world is not worthy of them. You go to other places, as I've had the privilege of going to Africa, Dominican Republic, places like that, you see people that live in little tin shacks. They urinate in the, in the streets. There's no, there's no, I mean, disease everywhere. I've seen little African ladies bent over, sweeping up a little aggregate to sell for what amounted to less than a dollar a day to try to just live, live. And you walk in the church at night, and there's a prayer meeting, and it's on fire. You can, the presence of the Lord is so real, you feel like you can touch him right there. And you're like, how is it that these people have so little but have so much of Jesus? How come we don't? Because we got too much. Because we're not willing to make those kinds of sacrifices. Sometimes we rely on our stuff. Instead of on Jesus, it's hard to want Jesus like he deserves to be wanted. When you have so much, Mother Teresa spent her life on the streets of Calcutta rescuing the broken and the destitute. I heard a story a long time ago about a cardinal that went there from uh, from the Vatican, all dressed in his fancy robes. He wanted to see the secret of Mother Teresa's ministry when she was still alive. So he went with her into the streets in his fancy cardinal robe, you know, all that stuff that they wear. And and I I don't even know how to describe it, but it's colorful and it's silky and it's, you know, and there's walking out in the streets. And I've been in the streets of Calcutta. It's, It's filthy. It's it's nasty. I, I've been through the garbage dumps there. There's people that live in the garbage dumps. I saw kids playing like it was a playground on heaps of garbage that stunk so bad, I didn't even want to roll the windows down. And this is where Mother Teresa spent her life and, and her ministry in this cardinal side. I just want to see the secret. And they're walking through the streets, and she's stopping, and she's praying with people, and she's calling people by name. And one day she walks, or one, one moment she walks by this alley, and she sees this guy, and she goes, oh, she runs to this guy. And, and this, as the story goes, he was filthy. He stunk so bad. He was mad at junk in his hair and his beard. And she cradled him in her arms, and she said, we found him. We found him. And the cardinal's thinking to himself, who is this? This must be like her son or some relative that she knows. We found him. Who would you find? We found Jesus, she said. And as much as you've done it, the least of these, you've done it unto me. Sacrifice. I mean, everybody she met, she was like, Jesus loves this person, this gnarly, crusty, matted hair person, and I'm willing to sacrifice all. And he found the secret to her ministry. Everybody she met, it's like she was ministering to Jesus. Jim Elliott, the missionary who gave his life to take the gospel to the Aka Indians, if you've never seen it before, watch the movie, The End of the Spear, tells the story. Uh, Reproduced not long ago, End of the Spear tells the story of these missionaries that went to minister to the Aka Indians, and they thought they were breaking through, and then one day, for whatever reason, they killed them all. They ran spears through them there on the beach, and they died. It's an amazing story. Through Gates of Splendor is the book that's about it. And years later, his widow went back, and they befriended him. And, and I, I think it was his son or somebody that came like best friends with one of the guys that murdered his dad. But he's famous for this saying. He is no fool who gives that which he cannot gain to keep that which he can never lose. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. And these examples inspire us. And I encourage you, if you're a parent or a grandparent, to find such true stories and read them to your kids because they need to know what sacrifice looks like. And I challenge us today as we close to fix our eyes on Jesus so we can write some stories of our own. How many of you'd like to do that? How many of you'd like to be a part of some stories? of sacrifice where somebody that you may not have even met now, someday, five years down from the road, I came into that church and I met this person and they helped me in this way and they gave to me in this way and I came to celebrate recovery and those people, they loved me when I didn't deserve to be loved and they sacrificed and today I know Jesus and I'm headed for heaven and my life has been redeemed. That's what it ought to be about to be in a church. 
sacrifice changes the world. It's the cure for selfishness. It's not a surrendered moment. It's a surrendered life. It's not just a couple tens in the offering. It's, Lord, all I have is yours. I love that little story about this little boy that a missionary came, was inviting people to give for the missions work that he was involved in. And they, 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 they took up an offering at the end of the service. And this little boy, the Holy Spirit was moving on him as a little kid. He said, he, he walked forward as people were coming and giving their offerings. He said, to the, he said to the usher, he said, whoever's holding the plate, put the plate low. He said, put the plate low. And he stepped in and he said, I don't have anything to give, so I give me. I give me. Sacrifice. Don't you know that changed that moment, that service right there. Man, it reminded me of another story. And I'm, I'll tell it quick. A guy that's in heaven now was a missionary in a difficult part of the world. And when he was raising money to go on the mission field, he was in his home church. And he had to raise thousands of dollars for the place that, that God had called him to go. And it started in his home church. And in that home church that night, they were receiving an offering after he preached. And he was not a like real boisterous preacher, but the Holy Spirit worked through him. I've seen him and had him in my own church. And they began to receive the offering. Everything changed when one lady came up and, and she laid a ring on the altar. And somebody came up and bought it and laid the offering down. And somebody came up and she laid it down. Somebody came up and bought it again and bought it again. And all of a sudden, thousands of dollars were given in the offering because of one person's sacrifice. Sacrifice changes things. Stand with me, if you will, all over the place today. And then we close with, a moment to let the Holy Spirit take some inventory on your heart. What are you about? Sometimes we come in his service. What are they going to do for me today, you know? Hope they make me feel good. Hope they, I think we come to church to, to, to experience Jesus, the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think we come to church to give the Holy Spirit a chance to talk to us. So do you dare? to let the Holy Spirit talk to you in this moment right now. What needs to change? What has your life become about? What are you so focused on? What are you, where's, where are you spending the majority of your time and your money? Holy Spirit, I don't even know how to to, to pray it big enough and right enough, but I'm praying that all across this place, like from person to person today, that the Holy Spirit would be talking to our hearts and that you would help us to be willing to sacrifice on a very deep level so that people who are broken and hurting and addicted and lost and confused, Jesus, we need your help. We need your help. Help us to be marked by supernatural sacrifice, willing to lay down our lives for what we believe, not selfish like Jesus. Thank you for these good people today. Thank you for their hearts, Lord Jesus. Melt their hearts in the presence of the Lord. We're, we're getting ready to walk out the doors, do some surgery, do some work, deep work in somebody's heart and life right now. God, Break down pride, break down selfishness. It could be a brand new day. Somebody just to go home today and say, I'm going to quit being so selfish and I'm going to love my wife like I've never loved her before. I'm going to love her like she deserves to be loved. I'm going to make it all about her. It could change somebody's life today just to say, Jesus, make me more like you. You are willing to lay down your life for others. Help us to be marked. Would you, would you just pray this as a church before we leave? Jesus, help us to be marked by selfishness, selflessness. Help us to be a church that is known for selflessness. Help us to be a church that's known for sacrifice. That Jesus, in making him known, is worth whatever it cost. Thank you for this church. May some of our best days be right around the corner because we have 
once again been filled with Jesus. Go with us today, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.